I'm Scott. I'm Bill. And, and we're, we're the, the Trade, Trade Guys. Guys. You're listening to The Trade Guys, a podcast produced by CSIS where we talk about trade in terms that everyone can understand. I'm H. Andrew Schwartz, and I'm here with Scott Miller and Bill Reinch, the CSIS Trade Guys. You're listening to The Trade Guys. This week, Bill and Scott will discuss two recent public opinion polls on trade, the enigmatic way the public thinks about trade, and how opinions and survey methods have changed over time. All this and more on The Trade Guys. Hi, Trade Guys. Good to see you as always. Evan here once again for a very special episode on polling. Not presidential polling. We won't get into that today. At least I don't think we will. We are sticking firmly within the realm of trade with two new public opinion polls from the Cato Institute and Pew, which seem to have somewhat conflicting findings. Now, the first, the Cato Institute 2024 Globalization and Trade Survey, was released on August 7th. And its headline numbers are that 63% of Americans want to increase trade with other nations, and 75% worry that tariffs are raising consumer prices. Some other key takeaways are that Americans generally support international trade, free but fair trade, subsidies to strategic industries, and reciprocal rather than unilateral trade programs. We find that most Americans support tariffs and Buy America policies in theory, but perhaps not in practice and do perceive some costs and benefits to trade. This study also finds that trade issues are unlikely to be a top priority for voters this year. So as I mentioned, we want to put that survey from Cato in conversation with another one from Pew. And the headline there is that a majority of Americans take a dim view of increased trade with other countries. And that's from July 29th. In this survey from Pew, they find that since 2021, Republicans have become increasingly skeptical of trade's benefits, while Democrats' views have stayed largely consistent. It also finds that 59% of Americans believe that America has lost more than it has gained from trade, which clearly contradicts what, what we were seeing in the Cato survey. Trade policy also in this survey was found to not be a priority for voters in this election. So guys, what stands out to you about these surveys? Well, first of all, I think it's important when you talk about any kind of opinion research to talk about the methods. Both of them are impressive studies. They have large bases, which I think is the most helpful part. The methods used by the Cato Institute were by a company, YouGov, which does a lot of survey research, and it's an internet-based company. Now, I point out that when the Gallup organization invented opinion polling, back in the 1950s, two things were true. Thing one was everyone had a home telephone, okay? And thing number two was when it rang in the evening, it always was answered, okay? (laughs) So opinion polling via telephone was really a great innovation in a 1950s world. But today, no one answers their phone. And many of us don't have home phones. We have our mobile and that it follows us around and tracks us everywhere. So but we certainly don't pick it up when a strange number calls. So someone not in your directory, if you pick up the phone, you're older than I am. But having said that, <laughs> these methods that are being used by both YouGov, which is a large panel, internet-based, so they have 2,000 or so respondents. Pew is the Pew Research, which does a lot of polling, works from a standing panel, which is demographically and geographically balanced. It's 8,000 respondents. But these are people who have agreed to be contacted. There's a, the opt-in uh, nature of it. Probably is reflected some ways, and uh, I'm sure Pew, which is a very sophisticated polling company, has done some things to ensure that is the realistic way to both ask questions and interpret the answers. There's a, a slight difference in method and approach between the two companies. And there's always a difference in the way the questions are asked, which in my days as a brand manager, you learn very quickly how you ask the question has a lot to do with the context of what kind of answers you get from consumers. So there's not a big surprise in the differences between them. The first thing that's common between the two polls and the results among most Americans is that while they have opinions on trade and trade policy and trade agreements, they tend to have very sort of soft support or opposition to it. It's not an issue which has a lot of intensity. How do I know that? Well, In the Pew Research Study, they actually ask people to rank issues on the level of importance, 
which gives you a feel for intensity. So jobs in the economy is at the top. It turns out trade agreements is at the bottom. <laughs> so it's not a particularly intense issue. It's visible in the Cato Institute's polling by the look at the number of people who don't know or don't have an answer to a specific question on whether it's trade with China or trade agreements or whatever. That is going on. And, and it's probably to the benefit of a trade advocate because people don't have strong notions about what's right or wrong to do in any situation. And because of that, if you can connect it with your issue, you can probably win. So when Donald Trump was president, he did a wonderful job of connecting his America first policies to his trade agenda and using it to say, we're going to get better deals because we want America to come out better. So when you can connect it to something like that, many people who uh, are interested in development of low-income countries will talk about trade as a way to do that. And that makes sense to people and tends to be supported by people, according to these polls. That gives you some, some opportunity to connect it to a bigger issue. But as a whole, it's not a make or break issue for voters or respondents in this case. The second thing I noted, there's a, a love of reciprocity. Reciprocity is something that scores well in trade polling, which for those of us who have any passing study of classical economics is a disappointment because, it, it, frankly, if you have free trade, you benefit from it whether or not your trading partner has an open market. It reminds me of the famous quote by uh, MIT's Paul Samuelson, who said, the only thing about classical economics that is both true and not obvious is Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. So, you know, it's one of these things we will never get it across. And this notion of fairness and reciprocity is deeply embedded in people's views about what makes a good trade agreement. So now with that said, I would say that the Pew Research examined differences by political party. And while the parties were often out of alignment with the voting members of Congress were often out of alignment with their voting base, Democrats were more pro-trade, Republicans more anti-trade. The voting tended to be reversed. That's come back into line since the Trump policies. So uh, Republican voters who are older, more rural, and more skeptical of government in general tend to be less embracing of free trade. Democratic voters who tend to be younger and more urban and less rural tend to embrace the world to a much greater extent. So with that said, one final comment is that if you're a politician or want to be an influencer, you've got a free reign here because the ratings for trade are surprisingly good given that nobody has talked positively about international trade since about 2008. <laughs> so we've either not talked about it or we've talked about it in negative terms, and yet it still comes out as fairly well-respected by voters. So there's an opportunity there somewhere. But with that, let me, uh, let's get Bill involved in the conversation. Well, first, Scott's story about the telephones reminded me there's the original telephone story was the opposite of what he was talking about. In, in 1936, when Franklin Roosevelt was running against Alf Landon, I think it was a, a newspaper did a, a national poll that projected that Landon was going to win. And in the end, you know, Roosevelt won by like two states, Kansas, which was where he was born, and Maine. It was overwhelming. And it turned out the reason was that the poll had been conducted by telephone. And in 1936, not that many people had phones in their home. And so what, he, what they ended up doing was contacting people that were proportionally wealthier. And they were voting Republican. And the people that didn't have phones, of which there were many more, voted for Roosevelt. So phones have had a checkered history. Some of this stuff is old news. I've been reporting on polling in my columns and in past lives for a long time. One of the things that, that I've noted regularly has been First of all, on the politics of it, that there is a difference in both parties between rank and file and leadership. The Democratic voters appear to be more pro-trade than Democratic politicians. And right now, I suppose you could say the Republic, it's, there's less of a difference on the Republican side between the politicians and the Republican voters. But that has a lot to do with where their support comes from. A lot of Democrats, not so much financial, but organizational support, get out the vote, driving people to polls, things like that comes from organized labor, which is trade skeptical. The Republican support often comes from the business community, which tends to be more pro-trade. But, you know, I've thought about why politicians who are out of sync with their own party get away with it. And the reason is exactly what Scott said. If you ask people what the top three issues are facing the country right now, trade comes in last. 
you know, it was 16 out of 16 in the Cato poll. It was 20 out of 20 in the Pew poll. And if you look at Pew's asked that question for at least 14 years, there was one year where trade moved up. For a while, they had a, a list of eight. And there was a, a one year when trade moved from number eight to number seven. But that was one year. It's just not on people's radar. People have opinions about it. That was the other thing I was going to say, which is what fascinates me about this is cognitive dissonance, which is essentially the ability to have two conflicting views at the same time and not worry about it. So if you look at some of the tables farther down, not the top line tables in the Cato study, one that I found very interesting was, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Okay, 77% of Americans agreed that Americans shouldn't be allowed to trade with people in countries that allow unsafe and unfair working conditions to persist. 68% of Americans said that U.S. citizens should be free to buy and sell to mostly anyone in the world without government interference. So these are 68% and 77% of the same people, okay? 65% agreed that people in other countries are stealing American technology when we trade with them. 63% agreed that globalization and trade with other countries has hollowed out the American middle class. 61% agreed that Americans are getting cheated by U.S. trade agreements with other countries. 61% said the U.S. becomes richer and safer as its people trade with people in countries throughout the world. And 55% said U.S. trading with China helps increase global stability and peace. Again, these are the same people, all right? And no one seems to notice that they are reflecting views that are entirely contradictory. I was also intrigued by a table that asks sort of a trade-related question, which is, are you in favor of subsidies or giving money to selected sectors? And it was interesting there that there was a bit of a split on which sector you're talking about. So for all the farmers out there that listen to us, you win. 62% of the people polled thought that subsidies to agriculture were a good idea. And then the fall off is sharp. 52% manufacturing, 48% green tech, 42% automobiles, and at the bottom of the pile, 36% for oil and gas. So, which has not been reflected in our politics, which continues to strongly support oil and gas subsidies. Another interesting example of, I would say, less cognitive dissonance than hypocrisy. One of the more interesting questions that Cato asked was, under what circumstances would you support a tariff on blue jeans? And so, if they were asked that question, do you just favor a tariff on blue jeans without any mention of what the price impact would be? 62% said yes, they would support it. But when you ask, would you support a tariff if it made blue jeans $5 more expensive? Only 58% said yes. And then the great divide. If it made blue jeans $10 more expensive, only 34% would support a tariff. And if it made a pair of blue jeans $25 more expensive, only 19% would support that. So there's some logic to that. Uh, in the sense that, you know, the higher the price goes, the less likely you are to buy it. That's basic economics. But you start out with, again, the same people saying, in general, 62% would support more tariffs. But then when you start talking to them about exactly what that means in practical terms, they tend to have a different view. The poll also brought out, Pew dealt with partisan differences. The Cato poll spent a little bit more time on demographic differences, and they had one interesting one on education, which has been done before and reveals no surprises, but it's worth mentioning. The question was, is it better to manufacture and make everything that we need inside the United States, or should we adopt comparative advantage, focus on what they make best and buy their stuff for what they make best? And people with a high school education or less 64% said we should make everything here, and only 36% said we should buy from the people that make the best stuff. But if you go to the other end of the education scale, which would be postgraduates, 55% said we should buy from other countries, and 45% said we should make everything here, which is interesting. That's a rather high number and a higher number than in the past, but it still is reflective of, you know, there's a difference of opinion based on education. 
Another piece of cognitive dissonance is they ask a very interesting question. Americans care about global poverty. 75% of the people are concerned about global poverty. 83% say reducing global poverty would improve stability in the most dangerous parts of the world and make us safer. 74% say one of the best things the U.S. government can do for the world's poor is to let Americans freely trade with them, which doesn't square with what they've said before. And then I'll close with what I thought was really the funniest, which they ask about, would you support a tariff on television sets if Joe Biden proposed it? And would you support a tariff on television sets if Donald Trump proposed it? And here I'm embarrassed to say the Democrats didn't do very well. 57% of Democrats said they would support the tariff if Biden proposed it, and only 35% said they'd support it if Trump proposed it. Same tariff. Republicans were a little bit more consistent. 51% said they would support it if Biden did it. 70% said they would support it if Trump did it. So at least they're both in the plus column, but there's still a difference. 49% said they'd oppose it if Biden proposed it. There is a partisan, kind of an odd partisan element to this, which we've seen on other issues on numerous occasions. Republicans, for example, opposing things in the Obama administration and then turning around and supporting them when proposed them, and then turning around around again and opposing them when Biden proposed them. You know, it's there is a political element in all of this. So I think that Scott covered the politics of this a little bit. So I think I will stop there. Well, let me just uh, say, first of all, uh, great thanks to these two organizations, the Cato Institute and the Pew Trust Uh, for people in the press, their their polling organization, whichever it is. They've made these these polls public, including the crosstabs and the details. So any of you who have time and on vacation and you get a little bored, we'll put the links in the show notes to this, but they are are available for your scrutiny and they're worth looking at. They're well done and well documented and the narrative support with with the numbers is quite quite good, quite coherent. So compliments to both organizations is a good way to refresh yourself for the the battles to come. Let me just add on one interesting thing. When you look at this stuff, look also, I think, the appendix in the Pew article, which has a little bit older data. And it's good to look at this stuff over time because things do change. And the most dramatic change, which Scott alluded to, is the Republican anti-trade tilt, because Republicans historically were the the pro-trade party. And starting around 2015, when Trump came on the political scene, Republican opposition to trade began to grow. It peaked around 2017, stabilized, and then it began to decline after 2020. There's a reflection of that in a couple polls that Pew included, which stop in 2022, but they go back to the year 2000. It's interesting, and you can see trends And one of the questions, which was, is trade an opportunity for growth through increased U.S. exports? Uh, And they sort that out by party. And for essentially 20 years, the parties, uh, plus independents, were not that far apart. In the first decade, which really was the Bush administration, Republicans were a little bit more pro-trade than Democrats and independents. Obama administration, it was the reverse, which validates something I said earlier. When Trump came in, the Republicans were still below the Democrats. And then in 2020, there was a very sharp dip on the Republican side in support trade as a growth opportunity, going from, it looks like, around 72, 73% in favor of that, down to 44% in 2021 and also in 2022. So a very sharp change in the Republican view. And you can see the same thing a little bit when you ask the question of what do you think foreign trade means for America? Do you see it more as an opportunity for growth or a threat? And again, for the first, and this is a, this one goes back to 1992. So you've got a lot of history here. And so in the 90s, you've got more people saying it's an opportunity than saying it's a threat. And then uh, briefly in the second Bush administration, you see a reversal. And then throughout the Obama administration, you see, again, opportunity actually triumphing, despite all the trade skeptics in the Democratic Party, peaking in 2020 with 79%, this is everybody, this is not by party, 79% saying trade is an opportunity, not a threat. And now it's lately, it's become to come down again. So 2022, it's down to 61%. And the people that view it as a threat have started to increase. 
So in 2020, only 18% said trade was a threat to our economy. Two years later, it was up to 35%. And I think now it's up higher than that. And on a partisan basis, if you look at the Republicans, it would be well into the 40s now. So these things do change over time. But I think one of the biggest takeaways for me is that for all the conversation about Republicans, Democrats, education or not education, income levels, old people versus young people, and you can see all this in the crosstabs, really at the bottom line is this is like last on people's list of things they care about. So basically what Scott and I have been doing for the last 40 years is futile. In terms of public opinion, yes. In terms of public opinion, yes. We'd like to think it's important, but... Now, it, it, it does make a difference. It does make a difference in people's lives. And I think those of us who support open markets ought to do a better job of saying so. Even when we have a complaint, we ought to start out with what's good about trade. What's good about trade is it raises living standards. It makes people, it gives people greater choice and it gives ideas space to travel. Trade is a meeting of the minds. And we ought to say that even when our next breath is a complaint about something unfair. As many of our podcasts are. Yes. Well, thanks, Evan. Appreciate you hosting this special episode. And I uh, hope people have a chance to think about things while they have some time away. And thanks also to Evan for doing all the work of prepping the studies and telling everybody what it was about, because we made the assumption that you probably all haven't read this in advance particularly since we didn't tell you it was coming. But I really, really urge you to take a look at this. This comes up over and over and over again, and particularly every election year. Trade used to fade away as an election issue. It played big in Democratic primaries historically. But Trump really put it on the map because for him, it's one of his biggest issues. He talks about it all the time. The week of August 10th, he gave a speech where he said uh, he's no longer th uh, thinking now about a 10% global tariff. It's a 10 to 20% global tariff. So he keeps escalating, and that puts it on the front page. Eventually, I think it will force his opponent to respond. So we'll see how it plays out, and we'll have more to say about that. Absolutely. We will look forward to that. See you all, not next week, but the following. To our listeners, if you have a question for the Trade Guys, write us at tradeguys at csis.org. That's tradeguys at csis.org. We'll read some of your emails and have the trade guys react to it. You've been listening to The Trade Guys, a CSIS podcast.